Hey everyone, it's Alan uh, Bircher, uh, Director of Swimming at Ellesmere College. Um, today we're, we're kind of taking a little bit of a different route. Um, we've got Neil Studd from uh, FSU with us and uh, I, I know Neil from a bit of paper actually. Um, I was chasing these records that have been set at Suffolk uh, County Championships and uh, every name was N Studd, N Studd, N Studd. And so uh, uh, Neil was born in, uh, in Ipswich, um, and or swam in Ipswich uh, as a club swimmer and he went out to the States on a scholarship system. He went through the NCAA system uh, and he's now coaching out in, in America. He's coached at World Championships in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on these, 2011, 2013, 2017 and uh, he's on an Olympic team coach in uh, 2012. And so what, what we're going to do today is we're going to have a bit of a look at um, kind of what it what it takes to do that and get it from someone who's done it and been there and, and come from the British background to that. Um, so firstly, welcome, Hi, Neil. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to, I've got about 15 questions. I'll just, uh, I'll start ticking off through them and, and see what we got. And then if there's anything that kind of sprays off the back of that, then great. Um, but number one, if, if you were, uh, if you, you're swimming at the Titans and you're looking to attend an American college. What's kind of the process and how do you go about applying or is it that you guys approach swimmers or just a generalization of it? Yeah, it's a bit of both ways. I mean, you know, obviously we're always looking for great talent and sometimes someone like you let, lets us know about it or, you know, we see them at a, a national event or whatever. So we're always looking. So it's really great when they reach out. Um, you know, I know there's lots of, agencies and things like that that some folks use and to be fair i don't know that you really need one you know and quite often it's just great to get an email with a, a one-page profile of hey here's my grades obviously being english i know um you know all the system there whether it's a levels or gccs i think it's changed now isn't it from gccs they just changed that um didn't they change the grading systems yeah yeah so maybe i don't know anymore i need to look it up but um <laughs> You know, uh, but it's it's just good to uh, get all that stuff, best times, a little bit about your background, and um, you know, I love looking at race video or training video or something just through you know YouTube link, and um, so you know, we're always reaching out. They can reach out to us. So I mean, it, it kind of works like that. And once once you've kind of had a few conversations, then we can start talking more about applying and and getting into school and all that stuff. And I mean, the whole visa situation is. You know, there's several steps to do. You've got to go to American Embassy and get a visa and all that good stuff. But um, that's all once you're admitted to the university. So um, there's quite a lot on that end of it. Um, I would just recommend that people just take one step at a time. And, um, but, but in terms of contacting and, um, you know, we always ask kids, how do you like to be, be recruited? You know, do you want to hear from us every week? Do you want to hear, you know, some emails? Like, you know, we try to work with the athlete and figure out what, what, what their preferred method is, you know. And so if once that kind of initial intro has been made, uh, I know that I've got quite a, f a few of the, the swimmers who uh, will have an, in or an interview or a chat online or a WhatsApp and, and it's just a, an ongoing conversation. Is there anything you're kind of looking for from them at that point or is it just to make them feel comfortable about the program and give them everything that they need to know to make the right choices? I think we're looking at lots of stuff really. We, I mean, I think the first thing is, um, are they really going to fit in here? I mean, we've had really good athletes come before. I mean, we have, you know, and maybe they just leaving home isn't for them. Like they might want to stay, you know, in England. We had a girl recently from Denmark who just loved everything about Denmark and spent a year with us and, and went home to Denmark. And, and it, was a, it was okay, but that's not what we want. We want four years really where we can develop people and, and learn about them and, 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 you know, do everything we can to make them faster. So, um, you know, I, I would say I'm, I'm looking at that, especially is this, is this the type of personality that's going to do well in the U.S., do well away from home? Um, ironically, you know, when they've been away from home already, you know, like at Elmsmere, it's kind of really prepares them for that. You know, it's the kids sometimes that haven't been away at home at all, that sometimes you're a little bit worried about how they're going to do away, you know, from mom or dad or whatever's going on. But, uh, you know, and then I'm, I'm looking to understand about their background, you know, um, you know, for me, it's, I hope they've got a great aerobic background and base and they've done a bunch of stuff, but they're not burnt out. And that's a fine line too. So I'm kind of looking at, okay, they've got a great background that we can work with and they're not going to get, you know, 
killed over here or whatever, but at the same time, is there still something left in the tank, some areas that we can work on, some skills and stuff to make them better? And that's where we talk to folks like you and, and, and do our homework too, because, um, you know, it's intimidating sometimes for a 16, 17 year old to be on a, on, a, on a Zoom or something like this and try to figure out all those questions. So sometimes it's really great to get the background from coaches. Um, and, and really, are they going to be a good teammate? Are they going to be someone that adds to the culture of the program? Um, you know, obviously, you know, it's a very team concept down here. That's an individual sport wrapped up in a team concept. Um, and just day to day, is it someone that, you know, we want to be around, we want to work with and, 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 and have fun every day with? Yeah, I like that. I, I know that it almost replicates exactly what we've spoken about previously is that, um, I found it really good from your program was that you picked up the phone and you, you we've got Phoebe and Pia coming over in uh, in August and uh, you picked up the phone and you said, tell me about Pia. And I, basically, I don't really care about her swimming. I just want to know about Pia. And tell me about Phoebe. I want to know about Phoebe. And, and, and I, I really like that concept of thinking about this person and how we can help develop them, but also develop their swimming. I thought that was, that was excellent. It came across really well. Um, I don't know if you just trying to put a show on for me. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I think it's not for everyone sometimes. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, there's great centers in England and there's, there's places to go and um, great coaches everywhere um, and bad coaches everywhere. You know, the, America's huge, right? So there's like so many options and so many places that, you know, um, you know, I landed in Florida, which, has always kind of been uh, a godsend to me. I love the sunshine, I love the beaches. And, you know, like there's places I think in Florida, uh, in the, sorry, in the US that just wouldn't have been a good fit for me. Uh, and I wouldn't have been as happy, you know what I mean? But at the same time, there is a type of personality that can travel, experience the culture, understand that like, yeah, not everything's great somewhere else or better somewhere else. It's stuff that you miss from home, but that's part of kind of, kind of the traveling experience a little bit. Yeah. And if, if you're based in the UK and uh, well, I guess at the moment, maybe virtual tours or however it may be done, but how does it work with visiting programs in the States? And are you allowed, is there a limit on numbers and time spent at programs? And, and just run us through yeah. that. So obviously with, with, with the way budgets are, I think things might be changing a little bit after this pandemic. Um, but typically uh, an athlete's allowed to take five official visits. Um, to five different schools if they want. Now, it's pretty hard to take five visits from the UK to the US. You might get, you know, maybe one or two together. You know, you go somewhere, I don't know, Thursday, Friday, and then somewhere else Saturday, Sunday, and then come home um, because you're only allowed to spend 48 hours on campus at each school. So you're traveling eight, nine hour flights, and then you've got 48 hours there. It can be tough. Um, I'm always a big fan of visits because it's a two-way process. We get to know them really well. Uh, they get to know us. They get to see what this is all about. They get to talk to the kids on the team. You know, do they feel like they fit in? See the campus, see everything. And, you know, I'm a little biased, but you see the beautiful 50-meter outdoor pool. We've got a, a, a nice 50-meter indoor pool. Like, the, you know, when they see the 80,000-seat stadium for our football team, like, it's like, wow, this is, you know, it, it really is. A different level when you see it so I'm always a fan of visits right now we've been uh, we kind of took a, a few chances on some virtual stuff we right before the pandemic we did a campus tour with the staff so the staff is in a golf cart and we've gone around the facilities and we did like a six-part um, introduction to the staff with, uh, the tour of the facilities or oh, we did a mock interview with me like if they were recruits how that that meeting with me on campus would be on that and we kind of took some chances. There's a, there's an attempt at humor in there. So if you guys see that on our website, um, I think the theme on mine was most interesting swim coach in the world. And um, so we kind of had some fun with that. Um, there's me benching and doing stupid things and downward dog. And so like it's, uh, we tried to just show that we're, we're kind of a fun staff and, and it's not all super serious, but um, those virtual tours really helped us. We've got, I think four transfers from different universities coming in that never visited us because of the pandemic. And they saw the tours, they, they kind of met with, Zoomed with the team and did some stuff. So it has changed a bit with this whole pandemic, but when things get back to normal, um, I still think visits are really important. Yeah. Um, they're expensive on our end. If someone's flying you out to America, you know how serious we are about you. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you know, can you fit in with the team and can you fit in with the coaches? The number one reason kids transfer or go to a different school is actually uh, the connection with the coach. That, it, you know, and so um, I, I think especially girls really look to connect with the team but they should also make sure that this is a staff and coaching staff that they can be around four or five hours a day. Um, do, it's kind of a, a joint together one here is uh, as US programs, do you need target times uh, or do you have a time that you look for, for them to get a decent scholarship? But in addition, if you have a swimmer coming from the UK with those times, is there anything in specifically you look for in a British swimmer? Because the, uh, because we're kind of a little bit different in terms of we're a little bit more withdrawn and not so uh, out there uh, at times. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we, we do have times, um, you know, and they're actually on our website under, you know, scholarship guidelines. I think you can go to that on our website. I think they're, I think they're all in yards. We, we, we look at conversions. Um, you know, one thing that we often look at, you know, UK kids is sometimes they swim long course as fast as they do short course meters. And sometimes it's just because they haven't rested short course meters at home. Like, you know, when I grew up, we, Winter Nationals was a big thing. We always put up some pretty good, you know, short course meters times at Winter Nationals. But, you know, obviously long course is the focus of British swimming, and I get that. And so sometimes we, we have to look at the nuances there. Like, well, are they, you know, are they better long course or are they just, you know, haven't rested short course? So we look at that stuff. Um, you, know, we, you know, I was out in Budapest at you know, world juniors and, and thought Pia had great underwaters, you know, so she, she dies. I actually asked her, you know, uh, after the meet, I was like, did you used to be a butterfly? And she's like, yeah, I did. <laughs> you know, and I was like, hey, well, that's so random. I said, well, you dove in and the hundred fly just took off, you know? And so there were some things that I thought would transfer well over the odds. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we do look at that athleticism. You know, I think the sport is going into some different areas. I mean, you know, Caleb Dressel and his like 41 inch vertical or whatever it is. Um, you know, we've been encouraging kids, hey, if, if there's something else that you can show us on a YouTube clip or something out of the box, if you can, you know, dunk a basketball or do something fun, like to show us what sort of an athlete you are to kind of fill in some of those gaps, that's really exciting. I love watching, you know, if some kids are doing some box jumps or doing something in the gym, you know, I'm not saying you have to do that. And, you know, don't want to get kids injured, but if you happen to be doing it and you have it on video, you know, that stuff's awesome to see. Um, so, yeah, anything like that's pretty interesting. And I guess the, the, the typical season for you guys is, is different to the way that a British model would run. You, you tapped on it there with a the short course. We pretty much now at the moment, we're September till December is a short course season. Um, we then roll into January, we start our long course season and uh, we run from January till sort of April when our champs will be is a long course season, ready setting yourselves up to make teams or to get your qualifying times for the British summers um, in July. So how does it look as a typical NCAA season in comparison? Yeah, I think the, the trick on our end is that obviously we get through to NC2As, our nationals are the women are the second week of March and men are the third week of March. And then just being able to, you know, double taper into April you know, um, which, which we've done really well. We have a bunch of Canadians on the team um, and they did really well at Canadian trials last year. And obviously that was kind of our run through for Olympics this year, which obviously Olympic trials never happened. So, um, you know, we felt like, um, you know, we did a bunch of best times long course in April after short course season finished in March. So, um, you know, it definitely could be done. We just have to plan for things a little bit better. Um, I would say for kids that come out to the US, when the season's over, uh, I think, you know, they, most schools take maybe two weeks off, but all the serious international kids just, just train through. So you've got to realize there can be some distractions in that period. I mean, spring break is, you know, well documented in the U.S. and people are going to the beach and people are going on cruises. Well, back then they were, and, you know, and, and different stuff. And so it just the individual just needs to be really focused on what they're doing. You know, would have, you know, out of like, maybe 60 kids on the team, there's probably 20 that are like super serious about their nationals at home, uh, different countries, US nationals, Olympic trials. So it's not too bad, but if you go to you know, some schools where you know, you've got to make sure that coach is on board with that planning process and they understand that, um, you know, 
I came over in hopes of making games and stuff like that. So I understand that like, you know, that's really important to international athletes is that we focus and work back from their trials. Um, the Canadians was, you know, particularly tight. This was going to be particularly tight this year for Olympic trials. So we actually really took some off the table for a couple of our Canadian kids so that they would really hopefully pop at trials and, and just know that, you know, there's nothing bigger than the Olympics. Uh, you know, I get paid for the NC2A season, but when kids go to the Olympic Games, it still looks awesome for my program. Um, you know, my bosses love all that stuff. So we really had focused uh, a little bit more on trials. And then, of course, it was all for nothing. <laughs> that worked, right? <laughs> um, uh, at, at Florida State, do you, um, are you coaching as relatively large groups or are you coaching as individual groups? I, I guess you've got a big coaching team there anyway. Do you take them down into individual, like middle distance, distance, sprint and so on? Yeah, exactly, exactly that, middle distance, uh, distance and sprint. Um, within that, we sometimes split up a little bit more, like middle D might split up into IM and freestyle or IM stroke freestyle. Um, in, the sprint co in the sprint group, um, which I coach with Emma, who's, a, who's an outstanding young lady that's um, from Sweden. She was actually on a relay and got a silver medal with Solstrom on a Swedish relay at European, junior, uh, European champs. Um, um, she coaches the sprint group with me. So it's kind of like an ideal situation. So sometimes we'll go upper sprint, lower sprint. Um, and then we've got a couple of middle distance coaches, distance coach. And then we have, I mean, I think I have 13 people on my staff. If you, co if you count, you know, the strength coach, it's always around. It's, it's his only job is men's and women's swimming. Um, we have a nutritionist that's around um, who pops up, pop in and out or whenever we need him. Um, you know, so we're, we're pretty fortunate um, with what we have. So we do get those ratios into pretty small groups. And then, you know, my job obviously is that I manage the whole thing. And while I'm focused in on my sort of 200 and down folks, you know, it's really important that I get around to the other groups a little bit. And, and having Emma on my staff really helps me do that because I can leave the group with her and everything's fine. So, um, you know, just want to make sure I connect with those other groups and make sure, you know, I like what we're seeing out of them. We sit around and, and talk about the plan and, and what we're doing every week. And um, sometimes I, you know, me and the group coach don't always decide. And in the end, we do it my way. <laughs> Standard. Uh, <laughs> um, what's, uh, I, I get asked this actually, and I don't know the answer, um, is what's the difference between a Div 1 program and a Div Division 2 program? So there's really, there's division one, division two, division three. Then there's like NAIA, which is not NC2A. And then there's junior college too, which is like a two year college. So um, there's quite, there's, there's a ton of options. So the biggest difference between division one, division two and division three, if you like, are different kind of rules. So if let's say you went to, um, you know, you went to a center in England for a few years and maybe graduated, um, you could still swim Division Two, uh, and 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 you know, be older. And you know, the, the joke is sometimes you get like you know a 31 year old on the block versus an 18 year old. You know, so Division Two doesn't have nearly as many rules. Um, division One has more scholarships. Division Two has a little less, and some schools won't have scholarship money. And then Division Three is non scholarship. Um, but the interesting thing about Division Three is there's some incredible coaches. There's some incredible programs. You look at like a, a Denison or an Emory and they've got guys and girls that could easily be division one. It's just the school they really wanted to go to. Um, you know, I think, you know, typically it's, it's, you know, division one is the kids are a little bit more about athletics and division three, they're a little bit more about academics, but it's not really that fair because you've got division one has Harvard in it. Right. And, and, and the Ivy league. So it's a bit of a mix up in a way, but in general, um, you know, obviously kids are trying to go to division three schools are looking for those academic scholarships and trying to pay their way that way. So if they get a great academic scholarship, it might be as good as a, a D one athletic scholarship. So, um, you know, there's, there's, I, I can't, you know, I, I want to say there's like a 150 division one men's programs and maybe like 250 women's programs in division one. And I'm not even sure about D2 and D3. There's a ton of D3 schools around the country. So, I mean, when you start looking at 
how many schools there are out here, you know, it's, it can be overwhelming unless you kind of come up with a criteria of like, okay, well, hey, I'm just going to look at D1. And then even within D1, there's what we call the power five, which is the five big conferences. Yeah. And then there's what we would call mid-major where I used to work. Uh, and, you know, the mid-major schools, like the school I used to work at doesn't have football. Well, football funds a lot of stuff that, that gives us a lot of facilities and a lot of extra money and training camps and stuff. So it's just a different experience. But maybe at a mid-major school, someone is like the big star and gets a full scholarship. You know, I swam at a mid-major school and that was a great, great fit for me. I was, you know, two miles from the beach in Florida and I was on a full ride and that was a good deal, you know. Um, and then, so there's there's definitely trade-offs in the whole on on the whole thing. And and I think at the end of the day, you know, Bob Bowman, who Michael Phelps's coach, he's a Seminole. He swam here, and uh, you know, I think he said it better than anyone. Um, there's a place for everybody. You just got to get on the right bus. On that, um, and nitty gritty is uh, medical care. We're obviously used to being fortunate having the NHS where we are, and. Uh, I know that that can become a costly addition in the States. Is that part of scholarships or, or deals within programs, or is that something that they take care of indi individually? Uh, I, you know, for us, it's part of us, part of our scholarship. Um, we take care of it. Um, at Florida State, it's about, um, it's almost 4,000 US dollars. So, you know, two and a half thousand pounds a year. So yeah, it's something that you want to make sure is covered. I think every school deals with medical insurance a little bit differently. So like, that's definitely a question you want to ask and make sure you kind of get included. Um, you can't be admitted to a U.S. school without it. Um, and, you know, so it's, you know, it's going to come up, you know, you're, you're either paying for it or the school's paying for it. Um, but it's obviously it's, it's super important. And, and it's the number one question that mums ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm going to ask you the dad question then is okay. uh, I went to uh, Flagstaff and went into the food hall and uh, my mm -hmm. jaw sunk to the floor and uh, I didn't know where to go first. So it's, uh, how does it work with campus food halls? Is it, is it the same as where I was, where it was a card activated, you pay at the end of the week or is, is that the same sort of thing? You can have that as part of your scholarship as well. Yeah, typically uh, we offer the food stipend and they can go ahead and buy that meal plan or, the truth is there's multiple meal plans in those food halls. You know, it, it might be, you know, sort of like a one meal a day meal plan or all three meals a day meal plan. Uh, and then there's, I mean, on campus, there's Starbucks and there's bagel shops and there's, you know, and so they've got little dollars at each of these stores. Uh, you know, we have an athletics one and it, it's sort of, anyone's allowed to come, but it's in such a spot in an athletic building that it's pretty much just athletes. And within there, um, you know, everything, all the calories, the, the protein, the macronutrients are all on the foods and everything like that. So we really highly recommend they go in there, um, depending on what they're working on with our nutritionists. Um, but then the truth is there's everything just on the edge of campus. I mean, everything from, you know, sushi joints to pizza places to everything. So I think the kids have so many options that not too many of them want to be on the the, the every day, three meals in the same place option. You know, they, they so, um, you know, they take, they keep a bunch of their cash and, and just go off campus too, because there's so many different, you know, potential places to eat. And then as a team, it feels like we're doing a free meal here, or if you host a recruit in town, you know, we're going out to my house for dinner, or we're going to a steakhouse for dinner, you know, there's, there's all these opportunities for them to pick up like other free food. So, they, you know, I kind of say, hey, don't max out the meal plan because mm -hmm. no matter how good it is, you get, you get annoyed in there three times a day, right? Like even as good as they are. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, it might not be what's best for you nutrition wise. We've got to back off sometimes a little bit. <laughs> Stick to the athletes one. Um, yeah. If, if you decide to uh, attend an American program, is it, uh, is it a stay on campus accommodation? Is that a one year thing or two years or do, and do you have, then you kind of go into houses with other swimmers or other people academic wise? Yeah, I think typically it's a one year thing. You don't have to stay on campus at Florida State as a freshman, but I recommend it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good atmosphere. You get to meet everybody. Um, 
you know, I, I know traditionally in the U.S. You used to share a bedroom, you know, um, and now that's kind of going on the wayside a little bit. So you get like, you know, four single rooms um, to a kitchen, two bathrooms, a living room, more of an apartment style, which maybe we're used to, you know. I remember being away meets at University of Leeds and that's where I stayed at, you know. Um, but these are a little bit nicer and, and there's, there's, you know, a lot of facilities on campus, a lot of people to meet and stuff like that. Uh, and then I would say almost, almost everyone on my team moves off year two. Uh, and the reason is that the dorms aren't cheap. So like if you run a scholarship, we'd just give you a check and go, hey, you know, you can do whatever you want year two. Uh, and some of the facilities and the housing situations they have by campus now are just sort of unbelievable. I mean, we're talking like, you know, zero entry pools um, with a huge TV for, you know, if Florida State's basketball team's on the road or football team's on the road, then that's what will be going on on the weekend at the pool. So you can kind of sit on a floaty and watch the game and um, volleyball courts, indoor gym, outdoor gym. I mean, it, it sort of looked like a Mexican style resort half of these places. So, you know, when I was in college, I was looking to save money. I was in the old house with, you know, five guys and, you know, uh, looked like a scene from Animal House. We're trying to save money and, and, and pack people in. Now it's like these guys are in loft apartments and, um, you know, going to the hot tub and all this crazy stuff. So, um, it's uh, there's some really amazing options, but you know there's also the cheap options too, which you know if people need to save money, they can and make money on the dorms. You know? Mostly Neil was talking about his house then. But, um, <laughs> uh, do you do you train yards uh, predominantly, or do you do long course or mix and match throughout the season, or specific times when you change? Yeah, we uh, obviously being Olympic year, we kind of focused a bit more this year on long course. Um, we actually gave the kids a choice. So we actually ran extra workouts. Um, and um, if, you know, if a, if a kid was new to our program and, you know, let's say they're a typical American 18 year old boy, they really want to focus on yards and kind of make a name for themselves NC 2 wise. Um, you know, we had some internationals that were really focused on uh, qualifying for Tokyo. And so we, we kind of came up with two plans. And it's funny because the first day at the team meeting, I kind of unveil these two opportunities and it's up to you. You can pick which one you want. And they all go, is this a trick? Which one do you want me? And I'm like, well, I really want you, you know, to be happy. Like this has been, um, you know, I think we would have lost some kids and they would have redshirted and taken an Olympic year off and maybe come back to us the year after if we hadn't, you know, given them this opportunity to focus on long course. Um, long story short, the long course section I felt went so well that I'm not sure that we're going to go back. Um, I, I was worried at first that my long course sprinters maybe might lose a little, you know, a little speed. I mean, it's still going about one long in the morning, one, one short in the afternoon. So it felt like in the end that worked out to be like um, a really good situation and they were finishing races really well. And so um, I think we're going to do that. Obviously now we have another Olympic year. So it's kind of like what we did last year was like a, a dry run for this year, hopefully. And so um, we basically are going one and one um, when we get right into the NC2A championships or, you know, like on taper season, on championship season, we just stay the odds. Um, but, you know, we've done some of the, the hard work long course. So, um, you know, I, I think some kids prefer either way. And that's why we had the two options. Um, it was just, it was tough on the coaches. We, I was making my staff take a, a morning off here or a morning off there because, you know, otherwise they're just going to be burnt out. But, um, yeah, and it, it did provide us too, which could be a thing here after COVID, um, of having smaller groups and, and who knows what practices are going to look like. We might have to do that yeah. for social distancing. So it's almost like we, we kind of have a plan in place for that, which is good. Perfect. What was well, um for for someone if they're if they're with us, I kind of I start getting them to start going through stuff at the uh, lower sixth really when they first join um, that lower sixth section of the college because it means it's two years until they move on or eighteen months I guess. Yep. Is that the right sort of time to be looking or to start the process? And what are there any rules around ages when you can speak to them, can't speak to them, and all that? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Uh, we start the 2022 um, August admit class. We start, we're allowed to contact them uh, this month, June 15th. Uh, so that's when that, I guess, lower sixth folks start. 
getting contacted. And I think, I think it's good for the, the kids in the UK to understand that in a little bit, you're competing with Americans for scholarships. And so you don't want to start too late. You don't want to get behind the eight ball here and, and like, you know, the opportunities aren't there because at the end of the day, there's only so much money each year based on who's leaving the program, who's graduating from the year before or who's graduating that year. And so you kind of want to be in the hunt. I think back in the day, you know, I remember when I looked, I didn't take a visit to Florida until April and I was going there that August. That's, that's pretty much done now. Like you gotta be ahead of the game. Um, if you wait that late to like up a six, you're hoping someone's leaving, you know, unexpectedly for you to take their spot or take their money if you like. So I think it's sometimes international uh, swimmers don't understand that there's only so much money around. And, you know, sometimes you've got to be a little bit lucky. I mean, maybe, you know, we had five guys last year under 49.5 long course. Like we weren't looking for another sprint freestyle guy. Like it's just, you know, we need to go get a breaststroke or a backstroker. So sometimes it might be, yeah, this is a great school, a perfect fit for you. But year one, we don't have the money. Are you still interested? We could give you money year two, three, and four. You know what I mean? But it, it's not personal. It's just that, you know, sometimes things have to work out the right way, you know. But definitely, I mean, I would, I would say if they want to contact universities June and July and when they, you know, lower six they should be talking to them and having conversations perfect um and last one actually uh, any further advice for swimmers considering studying and training in in america i mean i guess just some stuff i touched on is you know there's a lot of options there's a lot of places and i think with that many programs that many coaches there's there's good and bad of everything you know, I think I heard, you know, when I came out to the States, you know, oh, you know, the U.S. isn't good. It's not a good place to go. And you're like, well, it's crazy. There's so many places that's good and bad, you know, and, it's, you know, there's great coaches at home in the U.K. and there's great coaches all around the world. You just got to find the right ones and, you know, just look for the right fit. At the end of the day, you need to be happy wherever you're going. Um, and, you know, that that's a you need to be happy on the team. You need to be happy within the school. Um, you can look up the academic stuff. I mean, you know, F Florida State's 18th in the country for, for academics, for, for public schools, public universities, which is really, really high. Um, you know, that's important. I mean, that gives you contacts after college. It gives you um, more opportunities to get into grad school, things like that. So, um, you know, just kind of do your homework. But I think, like I said before, it can be overwhelming. So by the time you kind of narrow down, do I fit in on the team? Is it somewhere geographically I want to live? I mean, you know, you maybe you want to be downtown New York or maybe you want to be on the beach in Florida. That's a big difference. You know, um, you know, can I, can I fit well with the academics there? Is there a program that interests me? Um, I wouldn't worry too much. Like in the U.S., the first two years of the degree are a bit more general. And then the last two years are perhaps more like our degrees back home. Um, a bit more specific. So, you, you know, if you go to a bigger school, you do have more options to move around. You don't have to just pick a, uh, a degree and that's it. You can kind of actually declare what you want, like maybe after year one. Um, so there's maybe a little less stress on that, but it's still, it's nice if you, if you know you've got two or three options and your school has all of those options. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got to be happy there. Otherwise, the swimming, the school is just not going to go well. So find somewhere where you think you can be happy and, and, and fits you and fits your personality. That's great. Um, a, a thank you from me, really. I think uh, it, we kind of needed to, to hear that as a program and, uh, and we've obviously got a good link with ourselves at the moment and I hope that continues and we can keep sending some swimmers to you now. Uh, well, that's great. We're excited. I, my big thing is I'd like to get, get home and get over there and, and see some practices and, and spend some time with you guys. That'd be fun. In our little four lane 25. <laughs> it's amazing what you guys do there. It is. Like I was telling you before, I feel like it's like, uh, it's like my dad was a boxer. So I feel like it's like a tough gym, you know, where, where, where work gets done. I like it. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Neil. Cheers for that. Cheers. Thank you.